Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans, broadcasting from an undisclosed location. Welcome to the channel. Your reality crumbles when you exit a cult. That's the theme for my conversation today with a fellow ex-Jehovah's Witness who is also an ex-Bethelite. It's a pleasure to welcome to the channel Corey, who is from the Phantom Facts podcast. Welcome, Corey. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Lloyd. I almost called you John Cedars. I'm nervous. <laughs> wow. I've known you for that long, but that's wow. That's that <laughs> takes me back. That takes me back to the day. That's old school. Uh, that I followed yeah. you for a long time. Uh, the stuff you've done, and yeah, all the way back to then. And then you went to Lloyd Evans, and look at you now. So thank you so much for well, having me. Technically, I went. Sorry, what was that? Sorry. I said thank you so much for having me on your uh, show. Oh, it's a pleasure. I mean, technically, I went from Lloyd Evans to John Cedars back to Lloyd Evans, but yeah, I, I can you understand see, the confusion. Didn't know that. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> I, I, I found you when you were in that transition then. So, sure. I was, uh, yeah, I was like, oh, who is this guy just going to town? And it was, it was so different from what everyone else was doing. It was mm. very calm and collected and respectful. And I was just like, he is going to help so many people out you help yeah you know you help me through my transition too so that's Happy. really good to hear um yeah i mean I, I think most activists or i like to think most activists start out on this journey you know from a place of catharsis and kind of trying to heal themselves through trying to help others and i, I think for most it's like a two-year kind of burn where they they kind of get it all out of their system and 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 for one reason or another um i've ended up doing it now what i'm on what like 11 12 years so yep yeah well i mean you uh, switched right over to activism i mean it was an immediate and i i think you see like that with other people too uh you know with them going and crashing kingdom halls and stuff and everyone when they leave reacts a different way you know, yeah. but it, it the the effect is still the same. There's there, you can't leave and not have, go through some sort of effect because of it. Unfortunately, it feels indeed. Like and, and you know, we, we see, uh, you know, just to make things a little bit topical, you know, we we see that the kind of the the the, the greatest or darkest extreme manifested uh, in kind of the recent spate of um, ex Jehovah's Witness terrorist acts where we had the shooting in Hamburg, we had a bombing in, in India. Um, you I know, believe so, there was one in Colorado too, a shooting in Colorado. As well. So, you know, th this is a, this is a group that um, really impacts on people's mental health. And, you know, when, when you do that, when you, when you kind of tinker around with, with people's mental health in, in that way, um, it can have some very, very devastating effects you know so um thank you for for joining me um i i don't know too much about your story but you've been kind enough to provide me with a few notes and you know perhaps it would be good to start off with where we normally start with these conversations which is to say you know how did the jehovah's witness religion sort of make landfall in your life i was born into it and mm. uh my mother was born into it and uh, my father was at, as well or he might have been very young like four or something like that when uh grandma converted so it was you know cousins family everything i grew up in a i was born in a very small town about i guess not very small but it was well, around six seven thousand people and, uh, you know, so a congregation like that is, I think it was about 50 people inside of that congregation and half of them were cousins and uncles and, you know, just one of, one no of judging, the, no judging. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> small town, small town. And, and that's it. That was, well, I was eight till we moved to where the need was greater. Right. So, uh, we weren't down South, so they weren't attractive cousins, you know, that's for Alabama. And, mm. Um, no, it was, uh, you know, my dad was an elder, you know, growing up and uh, my brother was uh, on the uh, spectrum there with special needs. And so um, it was just in, we were Jehovah's Witnesses. That's 
who we were. I was door knocking, you know, from the time I was uh, born, I was going door to door. So it was one of those situations. And there's millions of people like that too. Do you feel like when you're in a family where the the, the patriarch is an elder, it adds a slightly different dynamic to, to the kind of Jehovah's Witness experience because you're kind of a bit more in the spotlight, aren't you, as a family? Yeah, there was very much a, like a push to be uh, visibly righteous, I guess. I don't know if, that, you know, you know what I mean? That's, and not all Jehovah's Witnesses are that way, but definitely when it comes to elders and, and circuit overseers, and, you know, those are things that are taken note of and reported back to the organization. So there was definitely a push to, and on top of that, because my brother was special needs, uh, the school system here went teach him past fourth grade. And so my mom decided to homeschool him and then decided it'd just be easier to homeschool me as well. And, uh, and so I was taken out of the school system after second grade and, um, you know, went through correspondence schools and stuff like that. Um, um, but uh, in hindsight, how do you feel about that? Oh, it was, you know, it's interesting. Like, I remember being told over and over again, like, not by everyone, but uh, by people who maybe uh, in the congregation weren't considered uh, the worthiest of vessels that I was sheltered. I remember hearing that a lot. You know, you're, the Hussing boys are sheltered and things like that. And I remember I'd always get offended by that, you know, because here I was. I was, you know, especially in my teenage years, I was pioneering at that time and all that stuff. So I felt like I was really putting myself out there, you know, experiencing the world and uh in reality, I, I think it turned out they were right. So, you know, but the, you know, it's a it's a tough day of reckoning when that comes. But it, you know, it starts so young. You know, I was baptized at eight, um, and I it was how I you know, and it's so funny because how I remember it is I remember asking to get baptized at seven, and my parents told me no, I had to wait a year, and I kept asking, and I was I was not this. Um, part in, part out. I was 100% all in on being the Well, best. to the extent you could be as a child. Yeah, uh, you know, exactly, right. Just, like what eight-year-old... Let's just knows. preface everything here by saying yes, that you, yeah. no, I, yes. you didn't have a clue what was going on, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so, but eight is very young to be baptized. Yeah, yeah, it was the... Yeah, it was. And it was touted out, you know, at circuit assemblies and things like that as well as this is the example we're looking for in parents who have children born into the truth. Like, you know, especially if the child wasn't baptized by the age of 12 in our circuit, you know, there was some questions being asked about, you know, how they, you know, how the child was being raised by the parents and, um, you know, responsibilities could be lost and pri or privileges, excuse me, privileges could be lost in the congregation. I don't know if it was the same for you in the UK. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's the same all over, isn't it? Although I think it, it varies a little bit depending on um, congregation to congregation how I think the culture is, is just slightly different depending on how, um, how shall we put it? how um serious the elders are you know i think some congregations seem to have more liberal uh, bodies of elders yeah um and i can actually remember when i was um getting baptized at the age of 11 um i was really enthusiastic about it and my, and my parents were like are you sure are you sure you know it's, it seems quite young um maybe you should wait a bit longer you know so um, I think the experiences differ slightly, but you know, mostly it's a, a universal, uh, you know, experience because the, of course, the dogma is universal. You know, there's only one way, one acceptable way to be a Jehovah's Witness. Well, I remember those dramas. Uh, you know, I would listen to those religiously every night. Those cassette tapes with, uh, I forget the one with uh, what it was called with Jehu. And it was the young girl that didn't know whether she should get baptized or not. And 
Uh, you know, they're like, well, you're responsible enough to drive a car, aren't you? You know, well, then you're responsible enough to get baptized. Just that type of messaging was so apparent, you know, and I don't know if you, they even have access to those old dramas. You well, know? one of my first ever videos that I, that I put out, uh, it's no longer on this channel because um, I, I, I took down a bunch of videos in the early days um, out of fear of copyright reprisals because back then Watchtower was really on, on point with their mm. copyright and YouTube didn't really know what it was doing on that regard. And I put out one video where Tony Morris was saying exactly that, that, you know, if, if you uh, have children and they're not baptized at the age of 16 or whatever, you know, you should say to them, um, so, you, you know, you want, you want to get a driving license, but you're not baptized yet. What's going on there? You know? So there is a recording of Tony Morrow. I mean, I know what, I know his words have, have less currency now <laughs> than they used to. I mean, to. it was, it was going back to, you know, Daniel Sidlick was, you know, yeah. asking for that type of stuff out of, mm. uh, out of families. You know, that was the benchmark that elders were to be looking for. Um, so yeah, it's just, you know, and. And, you know, it was funny because then it became a race of like, you know, who could become baptized sooner? You know, it was just sort of a weird, you know, it happens in one congregation and then another, you know, it seemed to spread. And, um, you know, it's, you know, it's horrible because now, you know, I've made a decision at eight years old that has, will, has affected me for the rest of my life. Mm. You know, and, you know, I definitely not a person to be bitter, you know, and I, you know, I see the irony of it, but the same time like how is you know how is that fair an eight-year-old made a you know this is affecting me almost into my you know i'm 36 now so sure now no i'm going to say something that, that could be quite contentious i'm just going to kind of put it out there and and you can react to it um and, and correct me if necessary but you know you, you've disclosed to me you know already that you you were homeschooled um and you've also mentioned in your notes that you um, well, we, we've said you, you got baptized at the age of eight, uh, but in your notes you've mentioned that you began auxiliary pioneering at the age of nine and regular pioneering at the age of 12. Um, I, I put it to you that your education cannot have been complete no. with, with that being the case. I'm going to, I'll be honest right here on uh, this large channel, I suck at math. <laughs> uh, it's not good. Well, um, probably you know, because and I'm, you were door knocking when you yeah, should have been learning math. You know, and I'm an electrician for Christ's sake. You know, I <laughs> yeah. break out. I, people think I'm texting. I'm just sitting here with my calculator trying to figure out a measurement. Yeah. So you know, but I. It's so odd, Lloyd, because like um, you know, the correspondence school I went through was accredited through the state I lived in. So you know, it counts as a you know, legal high school diploma. And thank God for my mother's foresight with that. But, um, you know, as you know, they dropped auxiliary pioneering hours from 70 to 50. And, uh, and so then we did that, we would do that, um, through the summer, you know, and then, uh, when I turned 12, um, you know, I was already being homeschooled. We figured out that, you know, in class, and I do high quotation marks on that, but, you know, it was always the, uh, you know, noon to four or something like that. And, and it was supervised by the state. The state threw a huge fit when we moved to the uh, state of Iowa, uh, holding my parents uh, to some DA uh, Department of Human Services is what it's called in that state, uh, but pretty much child services, you know, to really question what they were doing. And then, uh, Finally, it was agreed that a teacher would have to check in on us quarterly to make sure we weren't idiots. And um, so, and you know, and then of course, thankfully, the turn side. Oh, how would that go? Are you idiots? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes or no? <laughs> oh, you know. Well, we would use it as an opportunity to preach to her, and so it would. So we would count time. Never mind about that question <laughs> about idiots. Let's think about something more important. <laughs> we would, look at all the evil in the world yes. yeah you know or like you know i would give her what my talk you know because i'd be given a number two talk mm. and so like i would give my number two talk to her as practice 
uh, you know, and then, you know, that would be part of the, it was. I don't it, think these checkups yeah. were very rigorous from what uh, you're describing. No, she loved us. You know, she was like this yeah. little grandma lady that, uh, you know, just was entertained by it, I think, more than anything. And, you know, and we, as far as, you know, being able to communicate, the organization really takes care of that aspect of your training anyway, because you're, you're being inculcated with it for uh, three times a week on how mm. to speak and how to interact uh, according to their way, of course. But, you know, turns out to be, and I got a sales job after I got disfellowshipped and they gave me a little manual on how to sell. And it, and it, it was so close to reasoning from the scriptures. I was just, but <laughs> you were like, well, I do not need this. <laughs> yes. This is at least some parts of my education that I was complete. Well, like word for word. And so, yeah. It's, it's, you know. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you, uh, you know, you had a, a fairly, you know, kind of compromised education um, due to the wow. extent of your involvement in uh, preaching and pioneering. Um, and then it, it seems that you be, became involved in uh, RBC um, or, or Kingdom Hall building projects uh, from 16. Is that correct? Yeah. You know, we were on the concrete crew. And then, you know, when hurricanes would hit in certain parts of the states, we went, uh, we'd go down there with a group from a couple different congregations in our circuit. And, um, you know, that was, you know, I'd say that was looking back that I always found that sort of odd my first experience going you know being away from my parents and my congregation to uh, roof uh, these um, uh, brothers and sisters homes and uh, and just to think how it was sort of odd like we didn't really take care of anyone else you know like you know there was no like community help it was just for them you know and you'd be working next to some houses that you know clearly they needed a hand or you know, didn't have the finances and there was really no, uh, that's should have been a Jehovah's witness was a, and I just remember thinking that was sort of a little odd, but I just sort of shrugged it off, you know, cause I'm at, you know, I'm at that point. My dad was a Bethelite. I'm, tr you know, my goal from a young age, what was told to me was to go to Bethel, you know? And so my focus was on getting to Bethel and at, you know, pretty much all costs do whatever it takes. So I just, would shrug those things off as they, you know, came to me. Well, this might have been a bit beyond your pay grade, but isn't there a bit of a racket going on there when it comes to disaster response? Because don't they um, encourage the the witnesses to in, uh, make claims through their insurance and then give the check to the uh, the witnesses? That's it. Would not now. You know, that's interesting because they did have to pay for the material. Right. So, um, you know, and I, that was above my pay grade. I showed mm. up and they told me where to go. And, uh, you know, there was, you know, just people happy that we were there type of a situation. You know, it was that type of an experience. And I never heard anything about the back end. But that would not, it, it would not surprise me, obviously. I've heard those stories. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah it was such a horrible, it's just such a horrible thing to do. And you've got these people that are there genuinely we want you know you wanted to help people because their you know lives had been wrecked by these hurricanes you know i was down in katrina uh, after katrina happened and you would just see you know there was you know whole six thousand you know man suburbs just completely empty you know and um you know to take advantage of people during that time is just you know it seems like with finances too like with these loans and you know all the stuff you guys cover and uh, it's just man, how seedy. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So okay, so uh, again, you're you're really kind of getting involved very uh, extensively um, from a very early age, and uh, perhaps no surprise that you were appointed a ministerial servant at seventeen, um, and then you end up at Bethel at the age of nineteen. So. Talk us through how that happened. Well, it was, um, yeah, I, I got appointed ministerial servant. Um, me and my brother both got uh, appointed ministerial servants at uh, the same time. Uh, and me and my brother are very close. Um, 
he had a learning disability. So um, he had a hard time uh, writing and he couldn't really read. So when he'd have to give like a number two talk, he'd have to memorize it. That's how his brain works. So he just memorized, you know, all 18 verses or whatever it was. And so they, you know, as they made him a ministerial servant and me at the same time. So it was a real, you know, that my, my parents didn't know about it. So they were, you know, it was one of those situations where just, it was a, this moment of accomplishment and, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like bittersweet now to, you know, I haven't had to think about that in a minute, but, uh, cause you, you know, these are the, the only experiences you get with your parents, you know? Mm. And, uh, and so they're, you know, moment, you know, and it wasn't just my parents, but it's people in the congregation that, you know, looked after you cause it's, you know, small, small kingdom hall. So it's more like a crazy family than, you know, you know, I've been, you know, when you're in New York, you see a very different type of kingdom hall running than when you're, you know, the one you grow up in, in certain circumstances. So, but I was made a servant at the, when I just turned 19 and the very first job they gave me was the accounts. So it's almost like fantastic. We can, <laughs> we can get rid of this poison yes. chalice yes. and just give it to the newbie. <laughs> So I just, was, uh, and I hated, like we were saying before, I I hated maths, hated it with a passion. <laughs> Anything to do with money or counting was it was a just test from so Jehovah tedious Lloyd. to me. It was a test from Jehovah, uh, and, and and what was especially a test from Jehovah was all of the dear old sisters and brothers um, just kind of scraping the, the kind of the backs of their sofas to find whatever shrapnel or, or tiny <laughs> coins they could find and then accumulating it in a jar or something and then just emptying the jar into the box <laughs> so so you have <laughs> coins in all sorts of denominations some of which oh. are, ob are even obsolete currencies oh. um that you have to kind of pick through and then take to the bank yep so yeah. it uh, took a solid like yeah. hour and a half out of your week yeah, do it. You it know, was, like <laughs> I, was, I had my bedroom floor covered in like two peas and one peas and five peas <laughs> for for oh, it was a disaster. They yeah. made me uh, the territory. Uh, I can't even think of in charge of territories though, handing out territories for service, and uh, and then you know, and I became a Nazi, so everyone referred to me as a territory Nazi because I wouldn't let you. You had to get it done within two weeks. I gave everyone, you know, and so I was, you know. You ran a tight ship. Yeah, you I weren't literally a, tight, a Nazi. Yeah. You were just I very was, efficient. I was, yeah, <laughs> no, I was a Nazi. You know, <laughs> hunting people down, be like, you had this for three weeks. Okay. Uh, it's just, yeah, you know, I was all in. You know, yeah, I was very much all in. It sounds like you were too. Oh yeah, I, I took it super seriously, and um, I ended up um, moving to a different congregation and being given the territory assignment and. Um, one of the jobs I was given was to redo the territory maps, oh, yeah. and the, 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 the locals did not like my approach at all. What because, was your approach? Well, you know how um, most congregations have their territory cards on like brown cards yes. yep, that are yep. like the, like literally the size of a postcard. Yep. Well, I'd I'd seen in another congregation where they actually printed full color uh, laminated. Um, I would say, I guess you would say letter size uh, maps that you could keep in a wallet and you could keep as, you know, like loads of information in there. And it would be easier to keep it in like a filing system, even though it was larger. And obviously, because it was large, it was easier to kind of see the streets and point to the streets. And, and you wouldn't lose them. And you wouldn't lose them because it was so freaking big, yes. you know, and colorful. <laughs> so I decided to do that. And I made myself public enemy number one with yes, yes. various people in our congregation oh, who liked it done the old way, you know, where they were having to blink at this tiny, like, yeah. brown <laughs> piece of card, you know, so... The change tradition in a kingdom hall, it could be instant death for whoever... They don't like things done a different way, do they? The, the old 
the we, old we changed meeting times from 9 30 to 10 in a congregation and they, they got so they got so upset they brought it to the circuit overseer when he came out <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah those are the sorts of things that that raise that, that get get like the 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 pitchforks raised in a in a Jehovah's Witness congregation. Well, and it was fascinating too, because like my dad, he was you know it was serve where the need was greater mentality. So we moved to this one town when I was eight, and then we went to another town when I was uh, uh, I think I was twelve, and then we went to another congregation. And this congregation had been run by a, a family, um, and they were all elders, and their son had. Um, his wife had died in a tragic accident uh, years prior, and then he had fallen in love with this uh, this lady that wasn't a witness, and um, you know slept with her. And then um, he didn't get disfellowship, though he got uh, reproved or whatever. And so I, the instance was we uh, we got assigned. Uh, Dad got put there as a presiding overseer, and uh, and just you know. The, they were so upset by it. It was, it was, I had never seen any type of reaction like that uh, in a kingdom hall. Um, having dad come in there and, um, you know, they removed, they didn't remove them from being elders, but they removed them from any responsibility. So dad became the presiding overseer and just ran the congregation. And they wrote a letter to the district overseer with a list of complaints about our, uh, our family. And I didn't get to read it, but I, you know, I remember hearing mom, uh, you know, yelling at dad <laughs> about it. So, and one of them was about her singing, like she sang off key, you know, stuff like that. So she wrote the district overseer a letter, uh, you know, sort of defending herself. And uh, they uh, ended up removing my dad as an elder because he provided that information to my mom when it was in a classified meeting it should not have been discussed i mean i guess that's fair but the only the only thing i would say is that that happens all the time you know the um, the there's even in this year's convention um in the feature drama an example of of an elder passing on confidential information from an elders meeting to his wife or or, or at least oh, really? at the very yeah. least giving yeah. her a heads up Mm -hmm. on on what's happening in the congregation so it, it it's it's just kind of like an, an unspoken rule that, that this happens so for them to single out your dad in that way seems well and for my father you know that you know being an elder was his career you know like that was you know he would he was a cleaner at nights had a couple accounts and cleaned and uh you know, always provided for us, but his career was being an elder and being a pioneer. And, um, and so like for that to get removed, you know, I, you know, it took my dad to, you know, the really dark place and it sort of shattered this whole, um, illusion of happiness at the kingdom halls, you know, and I, I think I was about 16 when that happened. Mm. Uh, and then we moved back to our home congregation and uh, that's when I got appointed ministerial servant shortly after all that had gone down with my father's, you know, and you know how it was, Lloyd, an elder getting removed, you know, that's quite the talk of the the circuit, you know. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, the, the individual always ends up with their tail between their legs, feeling almost like they're disfellowshipped, but people can talk to them, you know, it's it's a really strange it was, situation yeah. to be in, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, you it, you begin to sort of see through this this sort of oh, it's brown nosing if we're being honest, you know. Yeah. These people that want to brown nose uh positions what they feel are posi you know, and it's so silly cuz they have no power whatsoever, but mm. you know, they, they you know, they do to those who are, you know, still witnesses very much so. So talk us how you you found yourself at Bethel, as I understand it, it was Wallkill, which is is now classed as the um, United States um, branch headquarters. United States needs its own branch, apparently. Yeah. So, um, how did you end up at Wallkill? Um, well, my dad worked in the bindery uh, in the seventies and eighties in Brooklyn, 
Uh, and so I, you know, when I applied for Bethel, um, I, you know, I wonder if they just put me in the bindery for that reason. Who knows why I got assigned there, but I got assigned to the bindery and, um, that was in 2006. And, um, I, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know what my, I mean, when it comes to Bethel, that was just, you know, it was a first experience away from anyone I knew. And I was surrounded by 2000, you know, 19 to 25 year olds that, you know, were just as all in as I was, you know, at least, you know, it seemed like that. And then, you know, after being in Bethel for, a, you know, a year or so, you start to see the cracks through the system for sure. You know, like one, I mean, there was an instance where one person was um, stealing underwear from. <laughs> when you said stealing, I, I, it's like it happened in slow motion. I heard the word stealing and <laughs> was stealing. I was immediately thinking, oh, no, was it money? It's, was it? it was, no. Oh, no. underwear. Oh, he was okay. stealing underwear. He was okay. stealing underwear um, or uh, during like um, uh, morning worship or. When it, you know, um, was it under- was it because he needed underwear, or was it because it was some kind of fetish? It where was, he was fetish. No, it was right. just, and the reason why I knew about this is because it was. It wasn't an underwear crisis. He was, wasn't stealing my underwear. For it some wasn't reason. like pe- people were having to fashion their <laughs> own underwear out of whatever materials they it could find. He wasn't just stealing them, Lloyd. He was cutting. He was cutting holes out of them. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> How did it, that not end up in the Pillowgate videos? I've, I, I've no idea, but okay. Um, uh, so shall we say lingerie was was being, yeah, um, yeah, was being well, taken. and I ended up knowing, you know, and it, uh, they found out who it was, and it was just like they immediately bought him a flight home. Um, the guy wrote a a letter and sent a check to pay back. Uh, the underwear he had stolen and he just disappeared. Or a gift card for Victoria Summers or something. You know, yes, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, you know, I feel bad laughing about it, Lord. You know, looking back, it is ridiculous. But, like, I feel you, can, this, you know, obviously this guy was, you know, he was um, gay. You know, yeah. he was gay. He was, you know, all these years of suppression being fought. And now, you know, he's got a little bit of freedom away from his congregation obviously not the way to handle it you know at 19 but you know form yeah, up, you u- know. ultimately it all stems from sexual repression doesn't yes, it and and, yeah. and, th- and these individuals not being given a healthy outlet for yes um, yeah and you know and then it would resort to something crazy like that and there was accounts of that you know like there had been uh the dirty dozen and they would go monday nights and when they should be at uh watchtower study um which was held every monday night in the auditorium and they would go out clubbing or just, you know, strip clubs or, you know, and there's just always little whispers of, you know, little groups that had done, done stuff like that. And they just disappear, you know, and um, it, it was the first time, like, you know, I was all, you know, I was 100% in. Here I am finally at Bethel, um, you know, and then I, I joined the Russian foreign congregation, joined the uh, language class to learn Russian and I'm studying Russian and they tell us, you know, you have to read about the history of the culture you're going to learn about, you know, because obviously my, my goal now was to become this missionary was my goal, you know? And uh, so um, I'm reading all these books on Russian history and, uh, and my roommate uh, is showing me these YouTube videos of like old Russian propaganda and in the same time, I'm reading about how the Russians use propaganda in, you know, their culture back then, the USSR. And I just start to be like, these are exactly, this is. Awkward. This is, yeah, this is, <laughs> you're like, you must, you know, you have What's to What's stuff I'm binding again in the factory? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ab- yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Wouldn't, you know, it's just, I, you know, I listen, I wish it was a way better story of how I, you know, you know, saw it for what it was and, you know, was able to No, I would say that's quite a good story because, you know, it's, it's how I think a good percentage of people wake up is, is that they, 
uh, they're able to compare. You know, it, it's like the compare contrast thing. Uh, like in my own case, um, in my waking up process, I was um, looking into Scientology and um, Mormonism, um, and we you know watching documentaries about those things. And you know, when when you see you know the commonalities. That's that's I think what helps everything just fall into place. So, you know, you're you're talking about basically that same process where you're you're looking at how propaganda has been used throughout history, and 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 you're, you know, making the the obvious comparison with with what it is that you're involved in. Well, and it was you know I, you know I wish it was that noble that. I saw these things and left on that accord. And it wasn't though, you know, I saw these things, you know, there was always little things. Like I remember my dad was there during the uh, great apostasy of the seventies when Franz left. And so I knew about that history growing up because I remember dad talking about uh, Franz leaving and uh, you know, the protesters outside of Brooklyn and um the little groups that had their own watchtower studies, uh, th you know, and, you know, that were, you know, finding faults and doctrines that were all removed from Bethel. And, uh, and so dad was, you know, 19 at that age. And of course, you know, I look back and I wish he would have picked the other side, but you know, he was, he was in the same position I was in. You took what the governing body was feeding you. Um, but you know, for me, it was, you know, I'm, you know, I, you know, I'm studying all this stuff about uh, Russian culture, and I'm starting to see links between um, propaganda being used there and in the type of explanation for repetition. You know, repetition is a big one because we were o we always had like every six months a talk on how important repetition was when studying the Bible in the in the uh, theocratic ministry school. There was always like so it's something about repetition. And uh, you see, you know, you see that a lot um, in any propaganda is the amount of repetition that's used to tell you something's OK. So um, but then, you know, what happened? The, I got kicked out of Bethel for um, I looked at uh, porn on my roommate's computer and uh, he didn't know, you know, he was gone. But I felt so guilty about it. You know, I went to my Bethel elder and told him about this and they decided the uh, course of action would be to remove me as a ministerial servant and then i could pick my own time to leave bethel within a month and um and then kenneth cook jr wrote my recommendation letter for it. <laughs> oh really yeah. So, wow. I, so uh, i am uh, the only apostate with a recommendation letter from a governing body <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's uh, which I appreciated because did you get his job. autograph in, so, on the letter? Yeah, he sick signed signed his name. Wow. And, you know, I'd have that framed. Oh, you know, I, it it disappeared after after I le I left. And, you know, I'm curious if my parents have it, but um, right, because they kept all that memorabilia type of stuff. But um, so aside from the, um, you know, you you mentioned the. I mean, the underwear story is quite funny. Thank you for sharing that. And and you mentioned as well the <clears throat> comparisons that you were doing between uh, Soviet propaganda and um, you know what you were doing. Uh, you know the the whole theology of of Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, were there any other anecdotes that spring to mind from your time in Bethel that kind of made you think, hmm, you know, is this not just like a, a any kind of you know, typical human organization. I uh, no, I was, mm. I was a hundred percent. And, and I, you know, I wish looking back, I guess, I don't know. I, I'm thinking of, as I was there, I was, you know, I was so crushed to be told to leave Bethel, you know, cause I felt I had just done Jehovah this huge disservice. And then I had let down my entire congregation you know, who had been excited to have their very first Bethelite sent out there, you know, and with Jehovah's Witnesses, it's all, it, it was all about the name, you know, like the title, sorry, the title, you know, like elder, ministerial servant, Bethelite. Um, there was, you know, just, 
you know, and I was very proud of those titles as I was able to check them off. And so to have it just all removed was, you know, devastating. And I genuinely felt that I had just, um, you know, really had let Satan, because they had told us about, you know, and, you know, obviously the Pellow Gates and the, you know, but the, the reasoning they use is, uh, if you do these things in Bethel, you are allowing the devil to enter into God's house. So it's this huge sin, you know, because Satan can't get into Bethel unless you're the one that lets him in by looking at naughty pictures, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, and so, and I believed it, you know. And so when, you know, when that happened, it was, you know, I was, I was devastated that it was me that had done it. But, but I, I would put it to you that you more than likely out of the hundreds or thousands of, you know, United States Bethel family members, more than likely there was more than just you watching porn oh, yeah. at, at that time. Yeah. And, and, and basically, you know, you, you paid a price for honesty because, you know, one of the most uh, jarring things that I discovered when again during the process of waking up i didn't even know this as an elder was the fact that you know there are loopholes for basically keeping quiet about things you know if you can if you do something that's um that's wrong it could even be like a gross sin and and you just keep quiet about it and enough time passes there are these don't ask don't tell provisions that kick in where they use language such as was there clear evidence of Jehovah's blessing during this period and blah blah blah, yeah. and essentially Interesting. I you, didn't you, know you that. get away with just a, a talking to, so so you paid a price just for being honest. Well, and they were implementing this uh, disfellowship, you know, because pornography wasn't a disfellowshipping offense uh, for quite some time. No, and... it's it's just a reprimand. Really? Uh, well, I thought they changed it in 08. To, uh, well, porno the that. way it works with pornography is, and obviously I don't want to get into what kind of pornography it was, but the way it works is that pornography is a, is a slapped wrist offense unless it is um, gay porn. And see, that's because so so, they so if it's heterosexual, you know, it's just a slapped wrist. Bringing back memories. Because I remember sitting yeah. in the room with, with two brothers, two Bethel elders, and they asked me what was it. Uh, they were like, well, is it uh, this type of. And they had a, the checklist. They were going through a checklist. And I was just like, well, what? No. You know, so. Um, uh, which is a sample of it. And... Yeah, which is probably <laughs> yeah, why I got the slap on the wrist, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it didn't feel like a slap on the wrist for sure. It felt like a little <laughs> bent over spanking is what it, <laughs> what it But no, like. seriously, if, if it's if it's straight porn, it's a slapped wrist. Um, well, it's and, good to and, know that there's differences in sin. Yeah. It's, well, we're, um, remember, we're dealing with a, a homophobic mm -hmm. organization. And, oh, yes. And, 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 and they're as well, surely, very well aware of the fact that, you know, pornography uh, and the viewing of it is, 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 a, is a very you know commonplace thing among among many people especially in, in a community where sexual repression is so rife so again you know I, I put it to you that um, well and I, you, you, I you were very sincere as a Bethelite and you ultimately paid the price just for being so sincere that you were honest about you know the slightest indiscretions that you uh, were, were guilty of yeah and and and, you know, it was, I grew up in a house where my mom was extra, you know, she had two boys and she was just, uh, because of her upbringing, extra sensitive to anything sexualized. Mm. And so, like, we would, you know, we'd, we'd have to record football games so that we could fast forward past cheerleader shots. You know, it was like, <laughs> it's, it was to that level. And so, <laughs> and so uh, you know, you know, the... You know, the amount of guilt I had at, you know, uh, for uh, for doing that, you know, it took, you know, I, I came back after Bethel, you know, I, I come back. Don't look at the cheerleaders. Don't look yes, at the cheerleaders. Yes, <laughs> you, you're joking. But uh, I saw my, the palm of my mother's hand often. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. You know, you know, and, I, you know, as any person, uh, obviously, I love my mother. But, you know, there was things that happened in her past that. You know that you know how these things just tumble on to the other generation, and you know you yeah. grow up and you look back and you're like, okay, well that's, you know, that's that. But 
But I think this is a really helpful insight into into just how much sexual repression there is. I mean, the, yeah. the fact that you weren't even allowed to look at cheerleaders, you know, it it just kind of speaks volumes. And, it, or, or, you know, the, the manner of your exit from Bethel seems almost inevitable given, given that background. So, um, you know, you um, ended up, as far as I understand, um, disfellowshipped uh, at the age of, of 21. Right. Yeah. Um, it was about six months after I got back from uh, Bethel. So, so what, if anything, you know, would you like to share? And you don't have to share anything if you don't want to, but uh, what would you like to share about that? Well, it was, uh, you know, I, you know, I went back to Bethel, or I got back from uh, Bethel. I went to my uh, home congregation. Um, and, uh, of course, it was just, you know, the whole reason, you know, I struggled with uh, not believing if there is a, a God or not is because I would have these moments out in the field ministry where you felt like God's spirit was there directing your conversation. You were remembering things that you didn't know you remembered. And you would just always, you know, you know, the experience, you know, you would say, you would blame it on God's Holy spirit is what would happen. And, you know, I got back from Bethel. Um, I was obviously just very depressed about it, you know, sort of this walk of shame that I was having to do. And, uh, and uh, my, my, mother had become convinced that um, it was a mental disorder. That was the reason this had all happened in the first place. And so she wanted uh, me to go see a doctor, get on medication and so forth. So just sort of to set up the whole process. And, uh, and I started drinking just very heavily. Of course, I had been uh, in a Russian congregation. I was a Bethelite. I don't know if you know what the rumors of Bethelites and drinking are, but... Uh, um, I could hold my own at that point in time when it came to uh, drinking with Russians. So I was, you know, and, and the funny, th I look back on it, it's so funny because, you know, I convinced myself to go to a bar. Uh, you know, it was this big pep talk to myself to just walk across the street and go into a bar for the first time. And I, when I got in the bar and I didn't know what to order because my I had never seen my parents drink. Um, and so, you know, I just ordered vodka because that's all, you know, the Russians I had hung out with had drunk when uh, we were out hanging out with them. So um, and I turned to alcohol uh, you know, pretty heavy there for, I would say, a solid six, six, seven months. And, um, and of course, then I, you know, you stop going to meetings. Uh, the elders in there are all family or family friends. And it's a small town. So. Eventually, someone points out that they see you going into a bar and um, uh, went to my judicial committee, um, got reproved. Um, I, they, I didn't think they really didn't want to disfellowship me. They wanted me to uh, just, you know, stop going to bars, I guess. I don't know. And then I didn't, though. And, uh, and, uh, and then they disfellowshiped me. Uh, it was like a month or two after that. So, okay. You know. So it was alcoholism, basically, that they yeah fellowship yep. you for. Okay, and um, I, so I don't I don't Just mean general to debauchery. I think it was. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, started smoking cigarettes. You know, it was. I think. In all seriousness, I don't think I've ever drunk as much as when I was a Jehovah's Witness. You know, that's that's the irony is that um, you, you just don't need it as much, I guess, when yeah. when your life isn't being controlled for you. But um, uh, without wanting to pry too much, do you feel like like you you are are more balanced and and more in moderation nowadays? Oh, it was a um, yes. I that was a very short period of. Mm. You know, and it's funny because it's it still to this day, I have family members that uh, that uh, are still concerned about me because of that period of time. Because I drank very heavily mm. um, during that period. But uh, no, I um, everything in moderation. So that's a good rule to live by with everything. So Absolutely. And, and of course, it's one thing to uh, be disfellowshipped or essentially ejected from the organization it's another thing entirely to to wake up and you know 
as as I say in the theme, um, it, it's a, a crushing thing to to discover that you know you know years or decades of your life have have just been wasted on on this false version of of reality. So, are you able to talk us through the point at which you you know you were able to kind of add everything up and and kind of see the man behind the curtain? You know, it was. I would say, you know, you talked about two years. Everyone gets their two years. So, mm -hmm. you know, I went, um, I I doubled that. I went four years just really ignoring the whole thing. And almost, um, you know, it reminded me of when communism fell in Russia. That's what re it reminds me when Jehovah's Witnesses leave that two-year period. Or, you know, with Russia, it was a decade where it was just they did everything opposite of what they had been controlled to do good mm -hmm. or bad, you know? And I think that was my experience. That was my experience is I just wanted to experience what was real, you know, because I had been living it like in this, uh, in this false reality, you know, I was living in the same town I'd grown up and preached in the whole time. And um, I felt like I was in a foreign country when I like hung out with people and talk, you know, it was just, you know, getting to actually know people instead of viewing them as a Hummeret, you know, or scum, you know, scum beneath your sandal. And these are, you know, some of the nicest people that it blew, it blew my mind how nice these people were, you know, and there'd be holidays and wouldn't know, wouldn't know any of them. And they just invite me to their house with their family to celebrate holidays. And I was, um, that that was the process where I I started to really like question what I had been trained to believe, and um, when I had my boy, I felt like that was the time to like come down and really decide what was I going to teach him. You know, because if this is the truth, I need to, you know, I need to teach him the truth so he doesn't, you know, die at Armageddon. And if it's not the truth, then I need to teach him never to, you know, never to fall for something like this, you know, make it stop with this generation. And um, I started with uh, a crisis of conscience. You know, someone had made an aud audio version of it on YouTube. And, oh, I remember that. Yeah. 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 And they I didn't never, like that. The copyright owners. They did. They did. But whoever did it, I am eternally grateful for because I couldn't afford the book at the time. You know, there was no yeah. way I was going to be able to buy that book. And um, man, like listening to Crisis of Conscience was, you know, because I had always heard uh, the Jehovah's Witness side of that, you know, argument, especially since it had been my dad who was had experienced it while he was there. Um, and then to hear his side of it just, you know, blew my mind. And so then, you know, and then, you know, I think after that, um, you know, I started, you know, looking at Facebook groups and I was sort of, uh, this being like 2012, you know, I was sort of turned off by just how, and I get it. Like a lot of these people have a lot of anger because of what, Jehovah's Witnesses did to them and parts of their lives that were taken away but uh, mix that with the internet you know and it's just it's pretty, can get pretty content, contentious and uh, I wasn't looking for that I wanted I wanted, it was, uh, I wanted to know what the truth was you know what was actually going on and uh, your channel you know was it was it it felt for the first time like it was listening to my language being spoken um, with um, at the same time, like, you know, just pointing out all these other stories of people you were bringing forth and people comfortable talking to you about a really horrible time because you're deciding, you know, am I going to leave my family? You know, I, you know, I'm, am I just going to have to move and, not have anyone trace me so I can't be disfellowshipped so I can technically be talked to. I mean, these are crazy scenarios people are going through, you know, and to realize that you're not the only crazy per, you know, you're not crazy for having to think through this scenario. There's thousands and upon thousands of other people that are out there thinking these things. And 
Um, you know, and then of course, you know, you do any little bit of digging and you immediately realize it's a cult, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, it, and I think partially I knew that, which is why I didn't really want to dig for a minute, you know, cause mm. I, 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 I just, you know, I knew I had been brainwashed in a cult and all those times going door to door, people saying you're brainwashed and then to have to, you know, own up to the fact that, uh, yes, I was indeed. It's kind of like you, you're aware that the rabbit hole is there. Yes. Yeah. But you don't quite want to embark yes, yes. down it straight away. It's you not know? going anywhere. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know it's going to be there tomorrow <laughs> and the next day, you know. And you'd rather have like your torch and, and your survival equipment ready. Yes. When yeah. you embark down there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You make sure you're ready for that mental journey because you're not going to end up happy by the end of it. You yes, know? It's not you know gonna it's going to be obsessing. Yeah, you know, and they, wow. we were trained yeah. to you know research and get, you know, of course, using witness material. But you thought you were putting in the effort to really research something, and um, and in an odd way, they teach you how to research that their own religion isn't legit. Um, you know, you, you're taught, you know, if you follow their research and how you're supposed to look up references and all that stuff, and you just, uh, you just shift the degree of attention one degree to everyone else's viewpoint and do that same type of research. It, it yeah, it's quite amazing. Wow. Well, I, I think many of, of those watching, we currently have 113 watching the live stream and I'm sure many will be watching after the fact, but I, I'm sure many can relate to, you know, your thoughts and, and expressions. And it is a, a horrifying, terrifying thing to, you know, realize that so much time was wasted. Um, incident, incidentally, I, w I will say that of, of all of the things that I probably would have enjoyed doing if I were a Bethelite, probably book binding was one of them because they were some beautiful books back, yes. back in the day. Yep. And we were hardcover. We were yeah, hardcover, so. the, the, the 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 one thing that I do like about my collection of Watchtower books is is the the hardcover period where everything and they use such lovely colours as well, um, un almost um, <laughs> almost unintentionally sort of mimicking uh, the Pride flag sometimes, but. Um, uh, it's that's it's, funny. It, it's 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 interesting. It, you mean it's, God's promise to the world, Lloyd? Yeah, uh, the rainbow. Yeah. yeah, I mean they uh, called it the Rutherford Rainbow, didn't they? Although that was much earlier. But I I, I do <laughs> think the books from that period were were gorgeous. So you're at least creating something that was aesthetically, from my point of view, at least nice. But nowadays, I think that. The paperback books are just look they just they just look pathetic. Uh, they look like anything that you could find in like a sales conference or something. Well, and we would we were so the the hardcover line and the soft cover line are divided by a um, just a little strip. And mm. so like you can see over into soft cover and hardcover can see over to your line. And so we and you know, this is I I I was just having so much fun there, you know? So like we, when, if you saw another one of your guys that worked in hardcover, we always, we always gave them this signal, you know, for hardcover. And then we'd see the soft guys. So we'd go like this and then flop our wrist. And I just, you know, they'd get so furious at us. So, you know, it's just a lot of childish antics we would do there. I got in trouble a lot. Um, it's a lot of horseplay. Wow. You were a hellraiser on well, the factory yeah, was, floor. Yeah. You know, the, <laughs> uh, they, we we me and Nathan Irwin invented a style of witnessing that was later in uh, I think a 2010 Watchtower um, Midnight Witnessing, and it was him and I that uh, came up with this, and uh, they eventually ran it in a, in one of the study articles. But we we'd wake up at two o'clock in the morning and go to gas stations that were open 24 seven, and preached. <laughs> I Just wonder if you were to ask someone who works in a in a gas station twenty four seven, would you like to experience a hold up, or would you like to be preached to by Jehovah's Witnesses? I wonder what their answer would be. You know, they <laughs> talked to us for hours. It was they were just like, ah. I look back, I was like, well, what else are you going to do? It makes sense, you know. They were so nice to us. <laughs> well, because you can't call the cops on Jehovah's Witnesses no. trying to preach to you, can we, you? But we, we, there was a cop. 
sitting in an alleyway as a speed trap. And we went up to him and offered him a watchtower. Wow. <laughs> so it's a shame it was... that you can't, you know, cuff someone for doing that. You know, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, yeah. we, we, yeah. we digress. I'm, I'm grateful. <laughs> I'm, I would have wore it as a badge of honor. Are you kidding me? If I had been arrested, they do that. Um, so I, I do have one final question, which I ask all of my um, interviewees. But I, I would like, since this is a live stream, um, interview to go through some of the comments because there have oh, been yeah. comments coming through and, and I would like to thank um, the super chats that have come through um, in support of the channel from uh, Lisa Burberry uh, we had one from Sharon Idol and we had one from Badger so thank you very much um, Calidora Reyes says it's unfortunate I'll probably miss this I've been struggling to pick the pieces of my life back up after leaving so you know this you know, even before we'd started talking, you know, sets the tone for how traumatizing, you know, this whole experience can be. Um, Han Ivanovic says, just lost my wonderful Croatian husband. The resurrection hope really did mess with my brain. Um, so again, you know, this is getting more into the, the dogma and the theology, but, um, you well, know, these are things horrible. that... That's profoundly horrible. affect people yeah you know horrible loss for um for her husband you know for her losing her husband but uh you know i you know and i i disagree with you we all have our own beliefs mm. when it comes to you know there's people who are atheists there are people who are agnostic there's people that mm. you know go to different religions you know yeah. and and find you know what you know which it blows my mind but I can't do that personally, but yeah. Um, the be- I think just the beautiful part of it is we have a chance to actually study it and and find comfort in ourselves instead of being told how to find comfort. Yeah, you know? and that inner strength that comes from that, you literally can conquer anything you yeah. want to afterwards because you're not a. F- you know who you are now. You didn't know who you were as a Jehovah's witness, you saw bits and pieces of yourself that were able to be categorized by the organization. But when you, mm. you know, when you leave and you have to sit there and actually, actually meditate and um, concentrate on what your belief system is, it, you can take solace in knowing it's at least your belief system. Yeah. I mean, I, I would never begrudge anyone um, a belief in the afterlife. I think that the thing that I find most grotesque about the resurrection hope is is it effectively uses uh, grief as a tool for keeping people inside. Yes. So it says, you know, if you, if you want to see your loved one again, you need to listen to what we have to tell you, you know, yeah. which I think is really messed up. Um, ben Fox says, Lloyd helped me. I was so scared I had made the wrong choice. Lloyd took away that fear. Thank you, Ben. I was, I'm very glad that I've been able to help someone in that way. Um, hello from Japan, says Caleb Parsons. Happy to be here. Nice to see Japan represented. Represented, yeah. Um, I wish I could impress you with my Japanese, but sadly, I don't have any Japanese to impress you with. Yeah, Kanishiwa. Uh, Kanishiwa, yeah. <laughs> um, don't, apart from that. Yes, um, yes. Now we've <laughs> solved it in entirety. <laughs> I apologize. Donny Be Good says, we're all traumatized, which is why we need this channel. I, th- I think most people who exit cults do have to deal with, with trauma of some kind. Um, Ginger Girl says, second generation, former Jehovah's Witness here, now out 16 years. Deconstruction took many years, but getting a degree helped me. Lloyd's channel has also been helpful. Thank you. And congratulations on getting that degree as well. I, I think you know, being able to, you know, move forward with your life uh, and pursue passions and not be ashamed to be successful uh, is a huge bonus when it comes to getting out of a group like Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, and to experience life as a ginger and a Jehovah's Witness, as I personally know, is very difficult. So oh, twice, <laughs> twice the accomplishment. There, so much prejudice out there. You, towards you laugh. People. You laugh. <laughs> All right, but I didn't. I don't see no ginger. Why don't you dye your little hair ginger? Tell me how it goes, Lloyd. I, well, that's one of the reasons why I had you on the channel because I believe in diversity. Yes, yes. 
Well, you're welcome. And I want to make sure I'm that glad all I could, glad I could peoples that are represented. Off. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, scraping Donnie, the bottom of the barrel over here now, huh? <laughs> Donnie P. Good says, I got bullied into baptism at 14, and I tried so hard to tell my parents I didn't want to. So, yeah, I, I think there's so much pressure, isn't there, to, to get baptized? Yeah. Um, Elizabeth Young says, Lloyd's channel prevented me from going further than being an unbaptized publisher. Thank you for saving me. Very glad to be get helpful in dragging you from the, from the brink in, in that way. Well, and you notice that they have just really sped up the whole baptism process, it feels like to me. And, you know, without channels like this to let you know what other things are said and you know, annual meetings and Bethel talks and what actually is going on, you're just getting a very narrow view of who Jehovah's Witnesses are. And then by the time you get to, you know, chapter 67, uh, it's too late. You know, you gotta, you're getting baptized. So. Indeed. Um, Sharon Idol says, yeah, I picked up a load of worthless coins when I went abroad as a kid. Everybody thought I was <laughs> so good filling the contribution <laughs> box with extremely low value foreign. That's I would have been cursing you, Sharon, if I'd have been the account servant. I would have been mentally planning all sorts of things to do to you in in retribution. Um, because honestly, that it was the bane of my existence when I was an account servant. Did you ever find yourself sitting and just trying to find the person who's putting these coins in the box? Well, I didn't have to... Sometimes, usually, I would see them because obviously, if you're emptying coins into a box, you make a lot of noise. And and if you're the one that needs to empty that box, that noise is like an alarm bell. You like immediately, you're looking across, wanting to know who's responsible for your anguish. You know, so uh, Badger says, "I can't wait until Lloyd gets somebody on here that used to spy on his channel for Watchtower." Who Lloyd helps deconvert. Well, in all seriousness, the ha you know those people do exist because I obviously had my hate speech series where Watchtower actually compiled a, a, a nine-page dossier of examples of quote-unquote hate speech that should have been enough to get me thrown off as a core participant for Ixa, and uh, Ixa wasn't buying it. So yeah, it would be interesting to one day interview one of those people. And, and and know how on earth that came about. Thanks, um, Badger. Appreciate that. Yeah. He's, just, he's like, you know, I'm over this guy. Can we get an actual spy on here? Hey, you know, honestly, you know, I, I would love to hear from these people. Um, it's amazing, these people that are releasing this stuff. Like, kudos to them, whoever's doing it. Like, yeah. uh, and because I, you know, you, everyone here who's an XJW knows the fear that goes into what you're doing. And if you get caught, you know, and yeah. the IT team in Bethel is no slouch. No. So, the, you know, there's a lot of foresight and planning that's going on releasing these. And thank you. That's it. Yeah. Thank you for releasing them. Indeed. Um, Paul Yerkes says it's everything su suppression, not just sexual repression. Yeah, there's many aspects of life in which you know, you're controlled and, you know, n normal decisions that you should be able to make if you were in a, in a, you know, living your life in a healthy way, you, you're not allowed to make, whether it's dress or grooming or entertainment or any of those things or having a facial hair. Um, so uh, Sharon Idol says, I used to find the constant repetition mind numbing and soul destroying. It was an insult to my intelligence. Well, of course, now we're on the outside, we can understand why the repetition was so necessary because, yeah. you know, that there is just the one narrative and they just have to keep repeating it, don't they? There's no, there's nothing to kind of build on. There's no way that they can, in any meaningful way, um, evolve the narrative. They just have to keep repeating it. Over well, and over. I mean, this annual meeting stuff that was released uh, about the we don't know you know, and I believe that's the an it was a the annual meeting where it was Splain and, and Jackson gave the duo talk there. But it, uh, you know, this whole we don't know thing is very new. You know, there's some yes. weird stuff going on now. Um, and I'm sure you're way more in tune, but I, I, I drop in maybe like once a year now to 
see what the old JWs are up to. And uh, the field service reporting thing blows my mind. And uh, this whole we don't know uh, on the timeline of when people can be saved or not saved, which can really be to my benefit. So, I, you know, I'm <laughs> so happy to hear that. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I think we're both screwed. Whatever <laughs> oh, happens. No. I really hate to break it to you. <laughs> it. Um, but no, um, in all seriousness, I'm obviously making fewer videos now, but uh, it is on my to-do list to um, just do kind of like um, a, a a highlights video from from the annual meeting and, and go into that in, in, in a bit more detail but i i don't know i i think there have been there's been some tweaking but ultimately uh you know when we're talking about repetition it's a case of you know the world's doomed when did the world become doomed yes. Our, garden of eden adam yeah. and eve uh, Jesus was the price for blah blah, and just re repeating over and over and over again, and um, it, it it does get very very dissatisfying intellectually, and 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 then when you actually get out and you start reading actual books by actual scholars and learning uh, even about the Bible and about about where the Bible comes from and who wrote it and and in what historical context, suddenly it all becomes really interesting because. People actually know what they're talking about, and they're not yeah. trying to control you. It's very refreshing. Um, Badger says, Sharon Idol, assuming that you're still in, the good part of being out is that you get to decide what is true and false. It may seem foreign, but it is so much more gratifying. And finally, a comment from Sylvia Eccles. My sister got sucked into Jehovah's Witnesses when she quit drugs, and her ex left her. I finally had to tell her we would get along a whole lot better. Now she never calls. How sad that you can't talk without witnessing. You Sorry know, it, it, there was horrible experiences where like um, uh, my girlfriend uh, would be, my mom would call my girlfriend at the end of each month and just talk to her all day. And, uh, you know, I remember my girlfriend being just, you know, so happy that she was being accepted into the family, even though I wasn't allowed to be talked to. And this whole time, you know that she's just doing it to count time, you know, and it's just such a, uh, it's, you know, such a horrible way to view people as, you know, oh, I can count time calling this person or mm. very dehumanizing. And, and you feel bad for, you know, I felt horrible for my girlfriend because she had no clue what was going on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, indeed. Well, listen, uh, it, it, we'll wrap up there, but I, I would just like to conclude um, with, with the question that I ask to everyone, really, who, who I interview, especially from an ex-Jehovah's Witness background. And, you know, that's, that's to say, you know, if someone were watching this interview, maybe even someone from your past, and, you know, they, are, they hold a candle for the Jehovah's Witness belief system. They may be a little bit on the fence. They may be a little bit doubtful. Um, they're terrified of, you know, as, as we said, their reality crumbling around them. They're, they're terrified of, of venturing down that rabbit hole. Um, what would be your advice to them? Uh, they have every right to feel terrified. And it will never be easy to do the right, to, to do the right thing. It's never easy to actually find out um, actual facts versus what you've been told. But it's, isn't it worth knowing the truth? You know, I, we're taught from a very young age to look for the truth. And um, that, you know, that truth is worth more than anything else. So, because uh, it affects who you are as a person and it can affect the trajectory of your life. So don't, I mean, it's terrifying but don't let your fear stop you from doing research and actually taking the time and making it the truth for yourself. Mm, absolutely. It's, it's a nice point of wisdom to end on. And if we can add another point of wisdom, don't steal other people's underwear. Yeah, don't, they, they might need don't, it. And don't leave uh, notes after you do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he left notes. He left notes. Yeah, a little oh, love notes. Grief. Interesting. Yeah. It was interesting. It was, yeah. And on that note, 
think. <laughs> but uh, no, Curry, it's been an absolute <laughs> pleasure Same uh, here. to have you on the channel. And uh, I'm sure our conversation will be very helpful for those watching it, uh, both who have watched it live and who will watch it after the fact. Um, thank you so much. And hopefully I'll get to speak to you again at some point in the future. Yes, same here. Uh, can I shout out my podcast real quick? Please. Oh, yes. Please promote the Phantom, hell out of uh, all you of your chance, things. Yes. If you get a chance, Phantom Facts Society. It's a, it's a horrible name, but it's a podcast for a curious mind. So cover a lot of cool little topics uh, about history. So um, if you get a chance, Phantom Facts Society. Thanks, Lloyd. Appreciate no it. problem. I put a link in the description to your YouTube channel as well. Thank you. So. Appreciate okay. it, man. So viewers, I hope you've enjoyed today's conversation. Don't forget that you can watch similar interviews and content by subscribing to the Lloyd Evans channel. But that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching.